What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD. And you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. The place where black men can freely express themselves. Straight up. No chaser. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, a place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Make sure you hit the subscribe and the like buttons so I can continue to provide you with some real good content. So today, what I would like to do is to expose you to a piece of literature, because I know you probably won't actively go and pick up the literature yourself you're probably deeming as something unworthy of your attention but what i'd like to do is read to you some excerpts from the combahee river collective statement okay and you ask well or you may ask well, what is the combahee river collective well it was a black feminist lesbian organization in Boston. And they did the work that they did from approximately 74 to 80. So I'm talking about 1974, of course, and 1980. So one of the things that the Combahee River Collective did was to try to illustrate that the feminist movement didn't work for them, nor did the civil rights movement work for them. And it didn't work for them because it didn't address their particular concerns as lesbian black women, okay? So what they wanted to do was to draft a document to show the various ways in which the civil rights movement failed them and how the white feminist movement had failed them, okay? So let me get into this. And I'm just giving, I'm just reading excerpts from it so that you can understand it. Because in my viewpoint, at some point, black men who are heterosexual, who seem cornered from all angles, need to be able to develop a manifesto of their own. Because we're doing really bad in this culture and in this society. When you look at all of the indexes of well-being, it seems that we're coming up dead last. Employment, we're not doing well in that. Education, we're not doing well there either. At any grade level, we're not doing well in college. A lot of us are dropping out. We're not doing well in graduate school. And even when we matriculate into professorships, we're not doing well there either. Okay? Incarceration. Early mortality. Poverty. I mean, so what we need to do is we need to develop, uh, develop an answer. We need to develop a program. We need to have an agenda of our own. A set of principles that we can actively work towards achieving or a set of guidelines that we can, you know, operate by. And we need more than just complaining. Yes, the public sphere is great. Yes, going your own way is awesome. But there are some real things that need to be changed in terms of policy in this country. The Combahee River Collective has worked its way into academia, and the members have worked their way into politics, we have nothing commensurate with it. And until we do, we're going to be left behind. So all I want to do is just try to give you some sense of what they did. Not that we need to borrow their playbook, but to say we need to have a playbook. We don't even have one. We don't have a playbook other than to leave everybody alone and go about our business. That's not organization. And I understand the sentiment. I get it. I do. 
but we also need to be politically active. And we need to start to infiltrate academia. And we need to start trying to create some sort of presence in the media. And we are there, but we're not there with an, with an agenda that works on our behalf or that works for our constituency. So that's what my aim is. So having said that, let me start off. So this is what these women say. We are a collective of black feminists who have been meeting together since 1974. During that time, we've been involved in the process of defining and clarifying our politics, while at the same time doing political work within our own group and in coalition with other progressive organizations and movements. The most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. So it's important, and I, I am going to take breaks here. So it's important to understand what they're arguing. And this is a precursor to intersectionality. This is the thinking that undergirds intersectional theory. So this is why I'm going through this exercise. Okay. So they say they're struggling against racism, sexism, heterosexual normativity, and class oppression. Those are four things or four faces of oppression that they're fighting against. Okay? Racism, sexism, heterosexual normativity, and class oppression. So it's about black and white. It's about men being sexist towards women. It's about homophobia, and it's also about money. It's about your status, your class status, in, in comparison to all of the other people or demographics in America, okay? So then they go on to say the following. We will discuss four major topics in the paper that follows. The genesis of contemporary black feminism. Two, what we believe that is, the specific province of our politics. Three, the problems in organizing black feminists, including a brief history of our collective. And four, black feminist issues and practice. Now, I think I might break this up into sections so that it's not overbearing for you all. But I want you to see what they've done so that something similar can be done on our account. And then also to hold them accountable for their own principles. To hold them accountable for their own ideals. Right? So, of course, they said that they're going to do four things. Right? In this paper. The first thing that they're going to do is talk about the genesis of contemporary black feminism. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look into the genesis of contemporary black feminism. And this is what they say. Before looking at the recent development of black feminism, we would like to affirm that we find our origins in the historical reality of Afro-American women's continuous life and death struggle for survival and liberation. Black women's extremely negative relationship to the American political system a system of white male rule, has always been determined by our membership in two oppressed racial and sexual castes. As Angela Davis points out in Reflections on the Black Woman's Role in the Community of Slaves, black women have always embodied, if only in their physical manifestation, an adversary stance to white male rule and have actively 
uh, and have actively resisted its inroads upon them and their communities in both dramatic and subtle ways. There have always been black women activists, some known, like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frances E.W. Harper, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell, and thousands upon thousands unknown, who have had a shared awareness of how their, how their sexual identity combined with their racial identity to make their whole life situation and the focus of their political struggles unique. Contemporary black feminism is the outgrowth of countless generations of personal sacrifice, militancy, and work by our mothers and sisters. So yes, I mean, I can't deny that, right? I can't deny that Harriet Tubman did good work or that Ida B. Wells did good work, right? Or that Mary Church Terrell didn't do good work, right? I can't deny that Sojourner Truth in her own way, I think she was a little bit misandrist. However, she did work in the behalf of black women. So you can't deny that. But then the question becomes, well, have black men helped you work towards your emancipation? Along the lines of race, at least. Right? But see, more generally, I think what this kind of thinking does, just my opinion, it already creates a division. Because now you're starting to think in terms of abstraction. Because there was an interdependent and interrelatedness amongst black men and women in relation to their emancipation. This is just the way that it was historically. But I'm digressing. They go on to say, a black feminist presence has evolved most obviously in connection with the second wave of the American women's movement beginning in the late 60s. Black, other third world, and working women have been involved in the feminist movement from its start. But both outside reactionary forces and racism and elitism within the movement itself have served to obscure our participation. In 1973, black feminists, primarily located in New York, felt the necessity of forming a separate black feminist group. This became the National Black Feminist Organization. Okay. So let me stop here. So basically what they're saying is from the outset of the feminist movement, particularly the, the second wave, okay, they were there. They were there. They were already in support of the feminist movement. They saw that they had an interest in pushing the agenda of feminism forward, right? But they say they were met with reactionary forces. They were met with racism and elitism right out of the gate. Okay, I'm going to get back to it. Black feminist politics have also, no, let me, re, let me start over. Black feminist politics also have an obvious connection to movements for black liberation, particularly those of the 1960s and 70s. Many of us were active in those movements, civil rights, black nationalism, the Black Panthers, and all of our lives were greatly affected and changed by their ideologies, their goals, and the tactics used to achieve their goals. It was our experience and disillusionment within these liberation movements, as well as experience on the periphery of the white male left that led to the need to develop a pro uh, politics that was anti-racist unlike those of white women, and anti-sexist, unlike those of black and white men. Okay, so they basically they're saying, okay, we were part of the civil rights movement. We were part of the black nationalist movements. We were part of the Black Panther movement and the black power movement. But when it came to feminism, they had a problem with white men, right, and women, and then when it came to 
being in the organizations that were resisting against racial domination and oppression, they feel like they were pushed to the periphery because of sexism. Okay? Then they go on to say, there is also undeniably a personal genesis for black feminism. That is, the political realization that comes from the seemingly personal experiences of individual black women's lives. Black feminists and many more black women who do not define themselves as feminists have all experienced sexual oppression as a constant factor in our day-to-day -day existence. As children, we realized that we were different from boys and that we were treated differently. For example, we were told in the same breath to be quiet, both for the sake of being ladylike and to make us less objectionable in the eyes of white people. As we grew older, we became aware that the threat of physical and sexual abuse by men Let me repeat that sentence. As we grew older, we became aware of the threat of physical and sexual abuse by men. However, we had no way of conceptualizing what was so apparent to us. What we knew was really happening. This, this paragraph is important here. So, in essence, they knew that there was a distinction between themselves and boys. Right. And they feel as if they were constrained in their expressiveness. Be ladylike. Don't be so loud and rancorous. You're not going to appear to be ladylike. Right. So they feel like they they feel as if they were constrained by social norms that prevented them from being the way that they wanted to be. And at the same time, as they got older, they were subjected to the threat of physical and sexual abuse by men. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing about this. And this is where, you know, there needs to be some pushback because it, it just seems to me as if women have monopolized the possibility of physical and sexual harm and abuse. I just don't like this narrative because it is a dichotomy as far as I'm concerned, whereby women are always the victims, men are always the perpetrators, and the threat of male danger is always there. Now, I don't know if this, something, it, uh, this is something that women imagine because men are bigger than they are, because men have more testosterone than they do. I just, I, I don't know how to even think about this. This is something that befuddles me because I, I'm just going to be honest, even though I live in a racist society and I know that there's danger looming around every corner. And I know that men, in all likelihood, have a greater chance of being killed from violent acts than almost any other demographic in America, if not right, the most subjected to violence in America. I don't walk around my day-to-day -day life feeling like I'm in danger. I don't know. Maybe you all do, but I don't. I just don't feel like that. So then the question becomes, if women do feel like this, why do they feel like this? Why do they feel like this? When it comes to domestic violence, we've already gone over this ad nauseum. But I, I think you need to hear it repeatedly because it's important for people to understand and to be able to say with a great degree of confidence that men are just as likely to be subjected to domestic violence in intimate partner relationships as women. Just as likely. Now, it is true that women are hurt more because men are stronger. 
but it, that does not belie the fact that women start a great deal of violence with men and they actually kill men. One third of the, of the victims of domestic violence homicide or intimate partner homicide are men. So out of 100, if there are 67 women that are killed, there's going to be 33 men that are killed. But what's also interesting about this phenomenon is that women are more likely to be harmed or to be hurt when the violence within the context of an intimate partner relationship is reciprocal. You got that right. When the men and women are fighting one another, that's when women get hurt. And it just doesn't happen in such a way that one person just throws a punch and then the woman dies. That's not how this happens. And it's not how arguments happen in the context of intimate partner relationships. What ends up happening is people start talking. They start disagreeing. They start swearing. They get in each other's face. Someone gets close. Someone pushes someone back. Someone pushes the other person back. Some person slaps another person. Some person slaps another person back. Somebody gets something and throws it at the person. You can see where this is going. But this is how domestic violence typically occurs within the context of any relationship. By and, for, by and large, it really never escalates to the point in which there's some sort of physical harm that's deadly, that's caused. But it often, but some, I don't want to say it, it often does, but sometimes it does. And that's why men have to be careful. If a woman ever exhibits this kind of behavior, I would encourage you to do a 180 and leave her alone because she's, subject, she's subjecting you to great danger. And you don't need to be exposed to danger in that manner. Okay? Also, as it pertains to rape, we are beginning to find out that men are just as likely to be sexually assaulted as women. And the numbers are off the Richter scale as it pertains to black men. I'll leave the article in which you can peruse uh, the study which illustrates this, but I don't want to digress too much because I already know I'm probably reaching the 20 minute mark or I've already passed it. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to close off and then I'll start with another section until I work my way through all four. But again, I think that this is a helpful exercise because many of you don't know what the Combahee River Collective is. I'm giving it to you so that you can understand exactly what it is and the impact that it's had on feminism and the impact that it's had on your life. Because you can trust and believe it, ha it has had an impact on your life. So let me get back to it. Black feminists often talk about their feelings of craziness before becoming conscious of the concepts of sexual politics, patriarchal rule, and most importantly, feminism, the political analysis and practice that we women use to struggle against our oppression. The fact that racial politics and indeed racism are pervasive factors in our lives did not allow us and still does not allow most black women to look more deeply into our own experiences. From that sharing and growing consciousness to build a politics that will change our lives and inevitably end our oppression. Our development must also be tied to the contemporary economic and political position of black people. The post-World War II generation of black youth was the first to be able to minimally partake of a certain educational, uh, uh, let me, so let me restart that sentence. The post-World War II generation of black youth was the first to be able to minimally partake of certain educational and employment options previously closed completely to black people. 
Although our economic position is still at the very bottom of the American capitalistic economy, a handful of us have, has, have been able to gain a uh, Although our economic position is still at the very bottom of the American capitalist uh, economy, a handful of us have been able to gain certain tools as a result of tokenism in education and employment, which potentially enable us to more effectively fight our oppression. <clears throat> Man, peep this now. Peep this. So, ultimately what they're doing with their group is what in political philosophy we would call consciousness race. They're beginning to have conversations with one another. And through those con uh, conversations, they're becoming conscious, they say, of sexual politics. And they're gaining the insight the ability to analyze, right, their feelings and to organize them into some sort of political philosophy which enables, which enables them to struggle against their oppression. I think we need to be doing the same thing. We need to be doing the same thing. And we need to be talking about our own experiences. And we need to be building a politics. And this is what they said. They said, even though we're at the bottom rung of the economic ladder, we know we are, but we know we have tokens who've been able to occupy certain positions and we're going to use people in our collective who are of the same mindset as we are to advance our politics so that ultimately we can fight our oppression. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? We're still organizing. We're still trotting around like bumble clogs. We're still trying to figure it out. I mean, yeah, we can leave, you know, women alone, but like there's some deep shit going on and it's become thoroughly immersed in the media. We have no pushback against it other than like conversations that we have over social media, but our narratives aren't promoted within the domain of, of popular media. But you can watch a movie on television or on Netflix, and you'll see their agenda being pushed ferociously. You can go to the academy, and at every major university, there will be a feminist philosopher who will be able to extol the principles of this collective. We have a few people here and there, like Dr. Johnson, and then you, and then you have a Tommy Curry who, who was driven out of the country because the very idea of talking about men's issues and bringing awareness to the humanity and the vulnerability of, of black men was considered to be something that was off limits. Something that was beyond good taste. Something that was detrimental to women. And I'm always, I'm perplexed by the possibility that people would think this way as if what we're arguing for is a zero sum situation. That's not what we're arguing for. We're arguing, we're arguing for the ability to thrive, to function, and to have social institutions and norms in place that benefit us and boys no less than women and girls. 
Let me get back to it. And this is the last paragraph, and, I'm, and then I'm going to close this off. They say, a combined anti-racist and anti-sexist position drew us together initially. And as we developed politically, we addressed ourselves to heterosexism and economic oppression under capitalism. So initially, they were about racism and sexism. Then later, they added the components hetero of heteronormativity and economic oppression. Now, this is before Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, but they were already thinking. They were already thinking about the various ways in which they considered themselves to be oppressed. All of the ways in which they considered themselves to be disadvantaged in this society. It's time for us to start doing the same thing and to lay out in a document that all of us can agree to. Whoever you are, if you want to sign on to it, that's why Dr. Johnson was saying, what is the black agenda, the black male agenda? What is it? I mean, we know what we're not going to do. So you can have a negative agenda. You can have a negative set of practices, meaning that there are things that you won't do in order to achieve your goals. One of those is MGTOW. And it's not negative in the sense that I'm saying it's pejorative. I'm saying it's negative in the sense that it's saying what you're not going to do. Like, I'm not dealing with women. I don't feel like putting myself in a vulnerable position with a woman and then losing all my property. Being exploited in the context of a relationship where the norms are, I have to provide, and then this person can at some point change their mind and then take all of what I've worked for and then potentially prevent me from seeing one of my children because she's angry or upset about something. And I think that black men are in the unique position to do this kind of work precisely because they're going to have to listen to us on the dimensions of race. They have to listen to us in ways in which they, they don't have to listen to white men. Because all they can do, all they have to do is just say we're privileged and we're white and then, it's, then, they, then they can shut them down. We're in a unique position to say something that no one else in the world can say in this society and in this culture. So anyway, I'm going to sign off for this section one. Coming up soon, I will cover, and this is not a very long uh, statement. It's very short and succinct, okay? So we've already gone on the genesis of contemporary black feminism. The next thing they're going to talk about is what they believe, right? What is the specific province of their politics? So I hope that this exercise has been uh, profitable to you in some way. I'm not going off on anybody here. I'm not engaged in uh, issuing invectives. I'm just trying to bring information. So until next time, be peaceful, stay positive. One.